My name is John Droche. I'm a uh, breast surgeon and I work here at, at Cadillac Clinic. Uh, I've been here for only a few months actually in the clinic, but I've actually been in town since 2005 and just recently closed my own practice to become employed in the Cadillac Clinic. Um, first of all, a little bit about me. Most of my training was done at the uh, University of Washington, except for my undergrad where I spent a little time at University of Idaho. Uh, I spent nine years over the University of Washington, uh, both for medical school and residency, and then spent my breast cancer training at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. So, I'm gonna try out my pointer here. I spent most of my time here and here, not much time here. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, people always ask me, well, wh why'd you come to the Tri-Cities then? And I said, these guys right here <laughs> and this lady. Uh, my wife's from Pasco. I came over here several times and really fell in love with the area. And I also knew we had a great medical community here. So that's really what drew me to this area. And so I came over here in 2005. And admittedly, when you leave the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance uh, with all that it has to offer, and I came over here, I was a little worried. but we actually have an excellent complement of uh, specialists here in, chemo th in uh, medical oncology, radiologists, radiation oncology, we have it all here. And so I was very happy and really felt like I fit in here and knew that we could take great care of patients here in the Tri-Cities. So what I wanna do tonight is just kind of give you an overview of kind of a comprehensive overview of how I counsel my patients and touch on some different aspects of breast cancer. I'm gonna probably back away from going into heavy detail, but at any time, don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask a question if you want more detail on something. I'm just gonna try to give you a nice comprehensive overview of what I, deal, what I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I'd like to talk about today is, is, first of all, what is breast cancer? How do we diagnose this? What are some of the surgical therapies that we use for it? And also touch on some of the other non-surgical therapies, such as chemotherapy, radiation and some of the hormonal treatments that we use. It's very interesting that we're actually here to talk today. Uh, it wasn't many years ago that we really couldn't talk about cancer. I don't know if any, many of you remember uh, 50, 60 years ago where people just didn't talk about it. And actually that's what these two uh, ladies, Fanny Rosenau and Teresa Lasser, back in the 1950s, both of which were diagnosed with breast cancer. And they wanted to put together a group of women to, who also had breast cancer just to talk about their experience. So they went to the New York Times, these two New York socialites, and said, hey, can we put an ad in the paper to talk about breast cancer? And the editor got on the phone and said, I'm sorry, Ms. Rosenau, but we can't publish the word breast <laughs> or cancer. Perhaps you should have a meeting that talks about women with chest diseases. <laughs> That didn't sit well with Fanny. So Fanny and Teresa actually got together and formed their own group, which is now what we know as Reach for Recovery. It's a, it's a nationwide uh, cancer support group for women. So we should start out by defining what we're talking about, which is breast cancer. All things bad in the breast originate from the ducts. So the ducts are the parts of the breast that, cr that make milk. These little lobules make the milk, then they drain down here through the main duct and out through the nipple. It's this part and this part where breast cancer originates from. This is, if you were to do a cross-section through this area, this is a normal duct. A duct that goes through the process of becoming cancer becomes more and more abnormal until eventually it turns into cancer, which then invades out of the duct into the lymph nodes and into the bloodstream to, to the rest of the body. That's where, this is where breast cancer originates from. What people always say, well, what caused this? They come sitting in my office, well, why did I get this? And for the most part, we don't have a lot of good specific answers for individual patients. We do know that because this happens more in women, it has to do with the monthly cyclic cycle of the breast being stimulated by estrogen. And at some point, one of those cells that I pointed out to you goes through a process where it becomes mutated. Estrogen is kind of like the, the foot on the gas pedal for a mutated cells, and then it erupts into breast cancer. The question still is, what happens at this level? What are the things that cause those cells to, to be pushed into breast cancer? We have some ideas, and it's probably multifactorial, and it's not just one thing. So here's a, an example of breast cancer up close. 
This is a section taken out of uh, breast tissue. Here's the white mass of breast cancer. This is a cross section of um, a woman who had stage four breast cancer. Uh, these are all breast cancer implants in her liver. We know that breast cancer is the second most common cancer in women. It's also the second most common cancer death in women, second only to, to lung. If we'd all stop smoking, breast cancer would be number one. Uh, lifetime risk overall for the general population is about 10%. And that increases with age, which makes sense. As women go through life and they are exposed to estrogen, we know it's a dose-dependent disease for the most part. In 2013, we estimate about 232,000 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year, and about 40,000 women will die. In 2005, and I, don't, I haven't seen the most recent estimates, but we know that at least in 2005, there are about two and a half million women living with the diagnosis of breast cancer. Uh, most breast cancer is sporadic, meaning people, it's just people minding their own business. I have uh, several women that just come to my office, and their question always is, but why me? I don't have a family history. Why did this happen to me? Well, that makes up most of it. It's mostly in women who ha are out minding their own business. We st we're seeing it more in uh, low-income countries. And as of today, 560 women will be told they have breast cancer. So what are some things that we know increase your risk? Uh, Angelina Jolie is obviously one of the more famous and more recent examples of someone who has a hereditary breast cancer. But we also know that women who have early menarche, so having their menses at a very early age and going into menopause at a late age, that means they have a longer time to be exposed to estrogen. Uh, no births or having a late first birth. Uh, the suspicion or the, the working theory on that is the longer a woman waits to, have, to uh, become pregnant or have a child, the longer the breast tissue remains in somewhat of an immature state. Pregnancy drives the, the breast tissue into a more stable state, for lack of a better term, without getting too detailed. And so we think that that's what the effect of having uh, 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 children at an early age pushes the breast tissue into a more stable state and making it less susceptible to breast cancer. Obviously, first degree relatives or family history of breast cancer we know increases your risk. Uh, exposure to radiation at an early age, and also the, the most well-documented and well-known gene mutations uh, as evidenced by Angelina Jolie, BRCA1 and the BRCA2 gene mutation. Oh, and also combined hormonal, uh, hormone replacement therapy. We know that estrogen press plus progesterone will increase a woman's risk for breast cancer. Estrogen alone, that still is uh, under debate. So what should make us suspect that you might have a, a hereditary uh, history of breast cancer if you see multiple generations of women having breast cancer or first degree relatives, women having breast cancer in, in premenopausal. I recently, for whatever reason this summer, just saw several women who are in their 40s with breast cancer. Again, all of them, or none of them, had any family history of breast cancer, but uh, one of which was, known to, was found to have a genetic mutation or a BRCA1 mutation. When you start seeing bilateral cancers or uh, women with ovarian plus breast cancer, all of these things start to create a picture of a woman who, or a family that has a genetic predisposition. Thankfully, we have a fantastic genetic counselor here at our facility, Sarah Hall, and she helps many, many women walk through this process of determining whether or not they have a family, um, uh, a family uh, history of breast cancer, or a family genetic mutation. So these are factors not shown to increase breast cancer. Doesn't mean they don't, it means we don't have the data yet. I really have a hard time putting this up there because I love blaming a lot of things on smoking. As of now, we can't fully blame uh, breast cancer on smoking. Data's still out though. Uh, diet, environmental factors, uh, oral birth control, I know it gets a bad rap all the time. I again have several women that come in they're in their 60s, they, they had previously used oral birth control for 15 years, and they, they, they're lamenting and they're blaming themselves for having used oral birth control for that long. Well, it really wasn't their fault. Oral birth control, in and of itself, probably doesn't increase their risk later on in life. It may at the time of use, but not later on in life. 
So now that we know all this, we know breast cancer is out there, what do we do about finding it early? That comes with screening. Many of you have been through this process, clearly technology designed by a man. <laughs> so I wouldn't say my favorite, but something that is heard in my office, more commonly than not, I'll know when I have breast cancer. Yeah, you will. Unfortunately, you'll know when it's a large mass and you have enlarged lymph nodes because it's spread. But I do still see a lot of women who refuse to have a mammogram because they just think they'll have a feeling or they'll know when they have breast cancer. Uh, having a feeling to know when you have breast cancer has not been proven in any randomized controlled trials to be effective. Uh, but we do know that mammogram is the only screening uh, modality known to reduce the risk of death from breast cancer. So we heavily endorse annual mammogram, getting an annual clinical breast exam, and, and becoming involved in your own care by doing monthly self-breast exams. And we'll talk about a little bit more about when you start that. So what do you look for if you do your own self-breast exam? A new lump, nipple drainage, rashes, redness, anything that, that is new that's persisting for more than a couple of weeks, I tell women, please come in, go see your primary care doc, figure out what the next step is. I have seen several women who say to me, listen, I'm really sorry I'm here, but I got this little thing right here that's, I know it's a nothing, and I'm sorry I'm wasting your time. And my usual response is, you're not wasting my time. I would rather see you for a something, or I'd rather see you for a nothing than have you come in too late for a big something. So I, I would rather see someone just even if they're just being a little neurotic, I'd rather see it and, and uh, tell them it's nothing to worry about. So when do we start screening for breast cancer? Usually, bre mammograms are not effective, typically in women under the age of 35, in that under 40 range, because most women at that age have dense breast tissue. Breast cancer in and of itself is dense. Therefore, finding it on a mammogram is very challenging and therefore, Mammograms are not that useful or effective in screening for breast cancer in that patient population. So, there, so we recommend that women start at the age of 40 or more. I know there's been some debate, there's been some controversy in the media about whether we're starting at 50 or 40, but being a breast cancer surgeon and seeing plenty of women who come in under the age of 50 with breast cancer, I continue to endorse that they start at the age of 40. Dr. Wales, one of our radiologists here, do you have any? Amen to that. Amen to that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, also continue to do your annual clinical breast exam, seeing your provider, whether it's an OBGYN, whether you come and see me, whether it's your family practice doc, just getting a clinical breast exam once per year. And again, as I mentioned, start doing your, your self-breast exams. We usually tell women to start doing it starting at around the age of 20, uh, but continuing to do that monthly once you hit the age of 40. So these are some additional modalities we use to screen for breast cancer or when we find something on a mammogram, we often will use MRI and ultrasound to, to help us further characterize what those findings are. So this is an MRI, great study, uh, high resolution you can see here, you can see the vessels, two large, very concerning lesions uh, in that breast. This is an ultrasound, uh, looking at a, a focused lesion here, this dark kind of ill-defined mass is a breast cancer. You may have recently seen in the newspaper, uh, I think it's KGH or Trios Health, they've recently um, were advertising they have 3D mammography. Uh, it's not truly 3D mammography, it is, it is more known as digital breast tomosynthesis. Essentially, it is not a better study, it is a different study and it may be able to, to help us see breast cancer better in, in more dense breast tissue. So I don't think it's a modality that's used for everybody. Uh, but essentially the breast is compressed and you have multiple x-rays that are passed through the breast tissue at different angles, hopefully allowing you to see the tissue better and minimize your recall rate. Meaning, if you were to come in and get a mammogram and we see something funny, we may need to call you back to do more focused x-rays to help clarify uh, whatever we're seeing on mammogram that we're concerned about. It may help reduce uh, those, the recall rate. So the, some of the advantages that it will help us uh, see better in, in dense breast tissue. The problem is there really haven't been any randomized controlled trials to date comparing 
standard mammogram with this new modality. So we really don't know ultimately if it's going to turn out to be a better study. It may, but then we have to decide who we're going to use it for. And currently, most insurance companies won't pay for this, this uh, uh, study. But I think it will definitely find its place in our uh, uh, armamentarium of, of screening women. So what are some things we typically find on mammogram that, are, that we're concerned about? Obviously, a mass. That's going to warrant additional workup and a biopsy. We also find less, uh, more subtle things like microcalcifications. These are just little bits of calcium found on the breast tissue. This can be representative of an early pre-malignant process called DCIS. And we would want to know about this because if you can capture it at an early stage, we can do something about it before it actually progresses into breast cancer. So when we do find something of concern, what do we do about it? That typically, typically at this point, you'll uh, move forward with the radiologist. They'll often do a biopsy. Or sometimes when we'll come to my office and we'll kind of decide how to, how to interpret and move forward with these mammographic findings. We, use, we have several methods to biopsy the tissue. Fine needle aspiration, we still use sometimes. But by and large, we're going to move to some kind of image-guided uh, modality. Uh, which includes, an, this is an ultrasound uh, guided biopsy. Here's the, here's the mass. We're guiding this needle into the mass to get a biopsy. The reason we want to do a, a lot of women say, well, well, wait a minute, why don't you just go to the operating room and just cut this thing out? Well, we, we like a little more of a, a coordinated uh, approach to this. We would prefer to do a percutaneous method, meaning just putting a little wire, a little something there to get a, a piece so we can make a diagnosis. If we can do that, we can keep you out of the operating room initially and get as much information up front so I can sit down with a woman and have a very detailed discussion about what the diagnosis is and then design a management plan for her. Rather than going to the operating room, taking a piece out, a few days later, pathologist says, Yep, this is breast cancer. Then it's back to the operating room. So we, we try to avoid that if we can. Sometimes we can't use that method and we have to move forward to what's called a wire localized biopsy. So if there's a lesion that I can't feel, I will need the radiologist to help. You still hear me? Uh, to, to guide me to that mass or that concerning finding. They will, they will put a wire into the breast down to that lesion or that finding on the mammogram. And then we'll go to the operating room that day. I'll make an incision in the skin. I'll, I'll take out that area. We'll send that off to the pathologist. And they'll look at it under the microscope and give us a diagnosis. And our radiologists are great at this, by the way. Um, again, clearly a man-driven uh, uh, piece of technology. This is a stereotactic needle biopsy. Uh, this is where we use a, a, a mammogram uh, to biopsy certain findings on, in the breast. The breast tissue is compressed, and then we guide a needle into the breast tissue to take out multiple core samples, and we'll look at those under the microscope. So what are the, some of the things that we may find that we're concerned about on mammogram? The first of all is DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ. This is the pre-malignant step to breast cancer. Not all women with DCIS are going to ultimately develop breast cancer, but we know that, it, that a large proportion of them will. The problem is we can't, uh, we can't look at an individual woman and say, you're, not, you're, going to get, you're going to get breast cancer and you're not. So we treat DCIS as if you will get breast cancer. Management is typically not as aggressive as with cancer because DCIS does not go to the lymph nodes. It does not go to the bloodstream. 20-year survival is 97%. The difference is this. Here's a normal duct. Here is DCIS, a bunch of abnormal, atypical cells filling the duct. You can see it kind of right here on this, on this x-ray. Here's, here's the duct. All these abnormal cells are just floating around in there. If I were to pluck out a cell of DCIS and pluck out a cell of cancer and look at those under the microscope, they look very much the same. They're very atypical mutated cells. What's different is the behavior. As you can see here, breast cancer is invading out of the duct, into the tissues, into the lymph nodes. And that's where we begin to see uh, the, the problems develop. This is invasive ductal carcinoma. This is breast cancer. This represents about 75% to 80% of all breast cancer. 
Uh, there are other subtypes, but this is the one that I most commonly deal with in my office. Uh, again, it's, it's mostly sporadic, only a small percentages are due to hereditary causes. And there are several things that we look at that I'll touch on a little bit later about what we, what we look at in order to kind of define and uh, determine how, I hate to use this word, but for lack of a better term, how aggressive a tumor is. This is a breast cancer here in the breast tissue, and again, here it is on mammogram. This is inflammatory breast cancer. This is something that we often hear about in the media. It really doesn't, uh, I've been here eight years and I do, uh, a, a lot of my practice is breast cancer and I've really only seen about five cases of this. It's essentially invasive ductal carcinoma, but what's different is the reason the breast is so red and painful is because all the cancer cells are engorging the lymphatics. They're spread throughout the breast. So we'll talk about stage a little bit later, but when women walk in with inflammatory breast cancer, uh, these women typically go straight to chemotherapy and they are immediately staged at a stage three unless we find evidence of disease elsewhere. It's in a very aggressive cancer. We tend to see it in younger women. Thankfully, it makes up only a small percentage of all breast cancer. So when a woman walks into my office, we, I, I really only have a couple of fundamental goals for, for that woman in terms of surgery. The first is staging, and I'll get, get at this a little bit more. Staging determines how far the cancer has progressed. And the reason that's important is because stage is, uh, determines prognosis. Earlier stage, much better chance of survival. Later stage is a worse prognosis. The other part of staging is uh, it helps us determine who needs adjuvant chemotherapy. So women with small early breast cancers likely aren't going to need chemotherapy, but as their cancer progresses, chemotherapy really becomes the curative or life-saving or life-extending uh, intervention. The second goal is to remove the disease in, in, the, in the breast, so to keep it from coming back locally. As much as surgeons hate to admit this with all of our bravado and our, sometimes we have egos, uh, <laughs> Surgery, for the, with the exception of very small breast cancers, by and large, surgery does not achieve a cure. Surgery does not achieve a cure. Surgery keeps it from coming back here. Chemotherapy is what saves lives. There I said it. Again, with stage, uh, we stage it uh, one, essentially zero through four. Zero is reserved for DCIS because it's not considered cancer, it's pre-malignant, but Formal breast cancer, we stage one through four. And again, stage predicts prognosis. Stage is determined by three variables. Tumor size, whether or not your lymph nodes are positive, and whether or not you have evidence of disease outside the body, like that earlier picture that I showed you, the cross-section through the liver with multiple implants of tumor, that's stage four disease. I, I typically will tell women, uh, you can't talk about surgery on the breast without kind of take, taking a step back and looking at the historical perspective. So William Halstead was kind of the forefather of breast cancer surgery. And this is prior to the advent of chemotherapy. And Dr. Halstead, great surgeon, liked his cocaine a little bit, but still a great surgeon, was, was the first chief of surgery at Johns Hopkins. He's also credited with uh, operating on his mother at two o'clock in the morning on the kitchen table and taking out her gallbladder. He uh, was really the one that pioneered the radical mastectomy, the big daddy of, of uh, breast cancer surgery. His belief was, if I am super aggressive and I take out a lot, I'm going to save women's lives. Well, he was wrong. So he would operate on women, do these big operations, and they would die two years later. So he would say, you know what, I need to be even more aggressive. And he would take out more more chest and, and, and these women would end up with these contorted arms and lymphedema, then they would die two years later. It wasn't until the advent of chemotherapy that we began to save lives. I, I love this picture. I mean, it's just a great picture. Uh, here's Halstead uh, operating away. I'm not sure what this guy's doing. He's kind of back in the corner there, kind of count, <laughs> probably went on into a psychiatry residency, he said, I'm not doing this stuff. Husband. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is a modified radical mastectomy. 
This is all the breast removed. This is the pectoralis muscle. Head is up here, feet down here, arm is coming out here. This is chest wall. All of this has been removed. Big operation. We still do it sometimes for more advanced disease, but it is something that we don't, we don't do as often because of this guy. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Fisher, Bernard Fisher, who is one of the pivotal researchers who, who began to ask the question, wait a minute, we are doing radical, radical surgery for these women that walk in with small breast cancers. Do we really need to be doing that? And he was the first one, well, he was a part of a team that said, listen, let's enroll thousands of women into a big study, and we call it the National Surgical Breast and Bowel Project, the NSABP trials, and compare women who have had standard mastectomy with women who have had lumpectomy, means going in and just taking out the tumor with a rim of normal breast tissue around it, and then give them radiation as well. So lumpectomy with radiation compared to mastectomy. And what we found is that there was no difference in survival. So kind of what Halstead touched on was, and got very frustrated by, doesn't, being more aggressive doesn't result in a better outcome. I have several women that come through that are obviously very stunned by the fact that they have breast cancer, and many of them, their first response is, I want them both off. Just take them off. Just take everything. Because uh, they think that being more aggressive is somehow going to ultimately result in a better prognosis, and that's not the case. There are still some people that need mastectomy, and there are still some people that need more aggressive surgery, but by and large, it's not the standard, it's the exception. So here you can see these are, all, these are comparing women who have had mastectomy versus lumpectomy versus lumpectomy with radiation. And when you look at their survival over 20 years, the curves are all the same. This is uh, recurrence rates. So a part of doing a lumpectomy, and I'll touch on that in just a few minutes, is you have to have radiation. If you don't have radiation to the rest of the breast tissue after you do a lumpectomy, your risk of having cancer come back in the breast is very high. It approaches 30%. And that's what this is showing. Those women who had lumpectomy plus radiation at 20 years had a very low risk of, of local recurrence. Those that did not have radiation had a much higher risk, approaching 30%. So now this, re this now represents the components of surgical therapy. Mastectomy, partial mastectomy, and then the separate part is, what do we do about the, the, the lymph nodes? And we now have the sentinel node biopsy or removing all the lymph nodes in the armpit. And I'll, I'll kind of go through this here in just a second. So first of all, the mastectomy. Very good operation. It's kind of the historical gold standard. It involves removing all of the breast tissue from the chest wall. Great local control. The, the likelihood of having breast cancer come back in the breast or in the chest wall is about 2 to 3%. This is a kind of an example of a mastectomy incision right here. In general, these women can avoid radiation because you removed all of the breast tissue, so you don't have to do anything more for the chest wall. There are still some women that need to have radiation after mastectomy. If they show up with more advanced disease or a large tumor, they're going to need to have radiation to reduce the risk of it coming back here. The disadvantages are obvious. It's a pretty cosmetically dramatic operation. We know from quality outcome data that a lot of women who have mastectomy versus bilateral mastectomy, they're not happy, but you know, it, it is, it's certainly necessary in some women. It's more invasive, and it typically involves a stay overnight, and you need to have a drain or two put in. This is partial mastectomy, or lumpectomy. Uh, involves taking the cancer out with a normal, uh, a rim of normal breast tissue around it. This is not a better operation, it is a more cosmetic one. So again, outcomes are the same, survival is the same. What's different is it's a better cosmetic outcome. Nice incision here, and really, you know, walking around uh, with clothing on, no one can tell. Um, the disadvantage is it requires radiation afterwards because if you don't radiate this tissue, the risk of having in-breast recurrence is about 30%. 20-year survival is equivalent to mastectomy. Maybe a slightly higher risk of having it come back in the breast, but overall it's great. If you anticipate that a woman comes in and after lumpectomy plus radiation, she's going to end up with a bad cosmetic outcome. For instance, a, a woman who has a small breast volume, large tumor, 
If you take that tumor out, give them radiation, they end up with a shriveled breast, you have not done that woman any favors. If you anticipate that this therapy is gonna have a bad cosmetic outcome, don't do it. Give them a mastectomy, they can avoid radiation and they can get reconstruction later. Who can't get partial mastectomy? Women who have had previous radiation, uh, again, if their breast volume isn't appropriate, if they have a history of con uh, connective tissue disease, also if they have multicentric disease. So if they have disease all over the breast, that's not really a good candidate for breast cancer, or uh, for a lumpectomy. How do we deliver radiation? Traditionally, it's given whole breast, so we give uh, radiation to the whole breast for four to six weeks, Monday through Friday. Uh, that will reduce your risk of, breast, uh, of cancer coming back in the breast significantly. We, over the last decade, we've been studying a new therapy called accelerated partial breast irradiation, where we actually insert a balloon into that lumpectomy cavity and then give radiation for approximately five days, and then they're done. Ten-year data suggests that it's equivalent to whole breast radiation. So here's a good example of that. Here's the balloon that goes in. We deliver radiation through there, and it, and it gives local radiation treatments. Cosmetic outcomes are a little bit better. Women are happier because they're done in five days. Here's kind of a cross-section. Uh, here, again, showing the, the balloon uh, inside the breast tissue. That's part one. What do we do? I've kind of gone over what we do with the breast. The second part of it is, well, what do we do with the lymph nodes? Because if you remember, in order to stage the tumor, we need tumor size, which we achieve with taking, uh, doing the breast surgery, but we also have to know what the lymph node status is. What we used to do is to go in and just take all the lymph nodes out of the armpit, just take them all out. Great surgery, you got a lot of lymph nodes and uh, it gave you a lot of good information, but it was oftentimes very uh, morbid for women because they ended up with swollen arms and nerve injury and wound infections. So we, what we've gone to is something called the sentinel node biopsy. Sentinel uh, stands for a person or thing that watches or stands. So it's the first draining lymph node out of the armpit. Essentially what we do is we inject a little dye around the nipple before we do this, the, the, uh, the mastectomy or lumpectomy, whatever we choose to do and we find that lymph node here before and, and make a small incision. This is an example where we've injected dye around the nipple area. It's drained down into the first draining lymph node and we will take those few little lymph nodes out and send those off. If they're negative, we stop there and we've only taken out two or three lymph nodes because any cancer that leaves the breast must pass through the central node first before it gets farther into the axilla. If those are positive, there's some debate on what we do from there on. Some women will go in and completely and, and move forward with a complete axillary lymph node surgery. Sometimes we'll just still stop there. This gives a good example. Here's the breast, multiple lymph nodes. Central nodes exist right about here. And the rest of the lymph nodes exist up into the armpit. Axillary lymph node dissection, removing all the lymph nodes from the armpit is still done for women that have more advanced disease. But by and large, we're backing away from it for, for several reasons. A lot of times if there's a positive lymph node, if the central node is positive, in many circumstances, it's the only positive node. We also know that again, getting back to Dr. Halstead, reaming out the lymph nodes here does not result in better outcomes. So this is non-surgical therapy. So uh, again, here's the surgeon holding back the maiden. Here's death trying to take the maiden from the surgeon. This is kind of how surgeons like to think of themselves. But the reality, with, as far as breast cancer is concerned, it really goes to, to medical oncologists. Medical oncologists were really the ones to come along, and they were the game changer. Chemotherapy saved lives, as I've said. Surgery just takes, takes, uh, removes the cancer from here. Again, it was Fisher that, said, that really uh, came and identified that, that breast cancer is a very tricky cancer. It acts differently than most cancers. Colon cancer is a good example. It starts in the colon, goes to the lymph nodes, and then goes to the liver. It has a very, kind of like a drop of water in a pool. It, it, it ripples out predictably. Breast cancer is not that way. When you look at women who show up with, with breast, small breast cancers and their lymph nodes are negative, and we don't treat them with chemotherapy, and then they die two years later. And the question is, well, wait a minute. Their lymph nodes were negative. Where, where was that cancer sitting? 
We know that in a lot of women, even if their lymph nodes are negative, breast cancer still behaves like a systemic wide disease. So that's why we select out certain women, even if their lymph nodes are negative, for needing chemotherapy. Most of the time it's young women, uh, women with bigger uh, tumors that show up. Chemotherapy typically lasts three to six months. Um, it, you know, I won't go into the details of it, but uh, it is certainly, it, it seems to be, of all the therapy for breast cancer, it seems to be the one thing that women are the most afraid of. In fact, they are often more afraid of chemotherapy than they are of the cancer itself. I have women come in to say, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, you know, you can do the surgery, you can do radiation, but I'm not going through chemotherapy. My usual response to them is, Imagine that you're in a, in a burning house and you've got one way out of that house and you can take the path out and you might get burned in the process, but it's your only path out. If you stay in the house, it's going to burn the ground and you're going to die. Your path out, that's chemotherapy because it, it's not perfect. The goal of chemotherapy is to kill the cancer. The problem is cancer is derived from our own tissue. So targeting only the cancer and not hurting normal tissue is very challenging. So it leads to things like nausea and vomiting, bone marrow suppression, ovarian flavor, uh, fa uh, failure, weight gain, heart dysfunction. There are certainly several side effects. But these are all things that, although troublesome, and can, but at least this offers a way to save lives or extend lives. The final thing that I mentioned earlier is breast cancer um, there are two different types of breast cancer, those cancers that have estrogen receptors and those that do not. Most, most campers, cancers show up with an estrogen receptor. Those are the, it's, think of them as, as, as antenna on the cell looking for estrogen. And we can, that's actually something that we want, something that we look for, because we can exploit that need by the cancer to block those receptors and render those cancer cells dormant. Um, so essentially, if, these, if estrogen mixes with a, a breast cancer cell, it'll cause it to rev up and divide and go crazy. So there are several medications we can use along with chemotherapy that block estrogen production, or they block the action of estrogen, or they completely downregulate those estrogen receptors and render those cells dormant. And we're using those in a lot of women today, sometimes even in the place of chemotherapy. I always get asked this. Oftentimes someone comes up to me after a talk and they're like, so should I stop my hormone, hormone replacement therapy? That's not an easy answer. There's no easy answer for that. But what I think it does require is a woman sitting down with her, her provider and going through an appropriate risk assessment. Someone who has a very normal average risk profile for uh, breast cancer, I, I support them in taking hormone replacement therapy. They may, if they can get off of uh, estrogen plus progesterone, which we know in most of the data is associated with a higher risk of developing breast cancer, as you encourage them to do that. But estrogen is, is actually a great, wonderful hormone. Uh, it has tremendous cardiovascular benefits. 350,000 women die every year of cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, I'm tending, in a lot of, my, a lot of women out there, you see, you see this, this kind of wholesale abandonment of estrogen which that we, we sh it shouldn't result in that. Estrogen is, is a wonderful, uh, in terms of osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease, so I encourage women to keep taking it that have an appropriate risk profile. Obviously, if you have a previous personal history of breast cancer, uh, we would need to have a talk. Um, it, w those women that are currently being treated for breast cancer, we must take them off for the reasons that I've mentioned that estrogen can interact with those cells and rev them up and uh, actually in, um, uh, increase the risk of, of breast cancer returning. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we have it all here. But, but breast cancer management and surgery requires more than just me, as much as I hate to say that. I try to quarterback it for all of my patients. But truly, it is a multidisciplinary approach. We need radiologists, we need surgeons, we need pathologists, we need uh, radiation oncologists and medical oncologists. We have all these available in the Tri-City. 
We may not, again, have it in a nice complete package like the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, but we're working on it. Uh, we're currently involved in trying to put together a breast cancer center of excellence through the uh, Tri-City um, Cancer Center. Uh, we have a great w uh, young women's group uh, here in town. We have great resources. So what, do you, what can you do? Become involved. Get your mammograms. Do your monthly self-breast exam. Eat healthy. Don't drink too much alcohol. I'm not saying you can't have a martini every once in a while. Uh, I still say don't smoke, even though it uh, is not really shown to increase your risk of breast cancer. Uh, make sure you, you, you develop a good partnership with whomever you decide to go to if you do develop uh, breast cancer. You're in control. You need to sit down and make the decisions along with whoever is taking care of you and move forward with a, a plan you both agree on in a partnership. Uh, questions? I know I blasted a lot of information. I usually say to my patients after I give them this big spiel and I've told them all this and they're just looking at me like they just drank from a fire hydrant. Uh, so uh, I know that was a lot of information to go over. So if, if you have questions, please do not hesitate.